Vielen Dank für die Charmante. Thank you for that charming introduction. My name is Dorian Biscop, and I'm going to be taking you on an emotional journey today, a journey through emotions. And we're going to be talking about emotions at the push of a button. Does digitalization work on all levels of the census? And I would like to introduce myself briefly to you. The question is always, what can she do? Why is she up at the front? Well, I've got all kinds of degrees as a current commercial salesperson. I've got a degree in standard um, management studies, and I've also trained in adult education, but that's also relevant because events always have something to do with learning. And I worked in a large telecommunication company organizing their events. I worked on the agency side of things as well and organized a whole host of different events. And then I had two children, and that meant that my professional focus shifted as well, focusing much more to working as a lecturer and a speaker. I'm also mountain director of the MICE Academy, and I also write articles for the magazine events. I imagine some of you might have read it. And when I was doing research on one of those articles, I realized I'm a millennial mom. They come from the Generation Y. Right at the very end of the Generation Y, in fact, that's the category I fit into, and I'm not ashamed to admit it here. Now, what makes me a millennial mom, apart from the fact that I've got children that I'm working well? Generally, I have 3.4 social media accounts. Yes, that's actually the case. I've got more accounts than that, as a matter of fact, in both my private life and professionally. I'm also generally 17.4 hours a week online, 17.4 hours a week, I engage with these social media, and I need various devices for that. I've got a laptop, a smartphone, an iPad at home, and all kinds of other gadgets. And they ultimately make life easier for me, and that is really the crux of the matter. That's why we're here today, and that's why digitalization and technology is so important. The whole point is to make life simpler for us. You can see that in certain everyday situations. It's become par for the course. And the question is how we can make good use of that when it comes to organizing events. And that means, of course, we also have to think about whether we can trigger emotions with that as well. So today, we're going to go on a journey through emotions First of all, looking at the psychology of emotions and neuronal research. And then we'll look at the next step and look at the digital realm and technologies, emotions. Well, where do they actually come from, as a matter of fact? They develop in our subconscious. An American philosopher once said that human beings Awareness is a bit like a government spokesperson who announces decisions without knowing how they really came into being. He wasn't present when they came into being, and he doesn't know their actual reasons. That was Dan Dennett, an American philosopher. Our emotions develop subconsciously, but it's a very highly developed appraisal and assessment system that actually ultimately determines what we do. And the lowest level of that system is where you find the emotional systems. And at that level, emotions determine what we do. Geneticists studying behavior say that 50% of the range of emotions that we have is actually innate. We have it from birth. And the rest comes from socialization, from culture, from learning experiences in the course of our lives. So it may actually change somewhat throughout our lives. The question is, are emotions the same thing as feelings? Generally, we use the term emotions to mean feelings. When you 
leave the room at the end of this short journey, you won't be doing that anymore because emotions are actually the basis for feelings. Those are the notions that we have that we can generally only identify ourselves. Let me give you an example to make it clearer. Imagine you've had an incredibly long day here. Perhaps you had a four-hour journey to get here in the morning as well. So after a long, hard day, you get back home or you sit down on the train or on the plane. You're annoyed, you're tired. Those are the feelings, but the emotions underpinning that are perhaps fury. You might be furious that the day was so long. You might be cross because the train is late. But when you get back home at last and finally have a chance to have a rest, you might be furious that the time that you could have spent with your friends and families enjoying it is actually being encroached upon because you're so tired and you're so f grumpy. Because So in that sense, feelings ultimately emerge from emotions. Emotions are situated very deeply within us. That's what guides our actions. And the purpose of emotions ultimately is to secure our survival. Emotions put us in a position where we're able to act unconsciously and subconsciously certain physiological processes are triggered. If we're afraid, for example, we will seek to escape to the right-hand side upwards. And of course, fear of public speaking is part and parcel of that. And if you see somebody who feels awkward about speaking, they'll be trying to escape looking to the right and up. But emotions are also important because they can be used to direct our perception to particular aspects. Psychologists who study emotions realized several years ago that there's the principle of basic emotions. Depending on which researcher you ask, you might conclude that there are five emotions or indeed as many as 12. And these are the basic emotions which shape our actions. So let me give you a brief run through of those. Joy, interest, and curiosity. Those are emotions which mean that we turn our attention to something. If we feel interested and curious about something, we're really involved. We're on board. We're present. And that is the key to success of your events as well. If people are having fun and enjoying something, it's much easier. You'll know that from day-to-day -day life, the things that I enjoy doing are things that I find easy as well, things that we prefer to put off and tend to be things that we're not very good at. So then we have fury, disgust, and distress. Fury is something that's almost self-explanatory. Clearly, it has negative connotations, but it can be highly motivational. It releases an enormous amount of energy. If you're facing a task that you're supposed to get to grips with and you direct your fury at that, you might actually find that participants somehow get involved. They might say, oh, I don't really feel like doing this. Oh, but actually, it's not so bad. And actually, I've managed. I'm proud of it. So actually, that can also be a way of triggering interest and pleasure, but rage should not be directed to destroying property or the head of the seminar or anything like that. Disgust. Well, that's also something which is important for our survival. Things that we find disgusting are generally not good for us. So if things have a weird smell, that's a signal to us. We find it disgusting. Better not to eat it, and that protects us as well. It protects us from food poisoning, for example. Distress, mourning, sadness, it's something which establishes emotional connections. If we're sad, it's visible through our posture and our physical expressions. We sit there like a heap of misery with our facial expression denoting sadness, our shoulders sunk, and people turn to us and they say, hey, what's up? So it's important for social connections. 
But this kind of sadness and distress also has a very important positive aspect. Social connections secure our survival, not on our own. We look for partners, we look for friends, we're connected to our families. We try to avoid separations because that makes us sad. In the framework of event organization, you can make good use of this. Don't make your participants sad, of course, but community building and networking aims at precisely that. There are events which focus on community building upstream as well. People get to know each other online a little. Look in more detail during the event at what you've been chatting about before, and you realize, oh, I like this this chap, or I like this woman. What happens if the next year you go along to the same Congress with a different topic? Well, the participants will be delighted to come along because you've organized such a great event, but also because they met such wonderful people there, and they want to see them again. So social connections are absolutely essential. Fear. That's actually the most dreadful emotion you can trigger. In terms of evolutionary biology, it makes an enormous amount of sense because then you escape. In our historical past, we had to flee from saber-toothed tigers and mammoths and whatever. Our risk level is relatively low in comparison with that sort of setting. We live in a safe environment in the context of environments, fear and an event, the event environment, people might be worried, for example, about the technology. Oh, I have to log in with an app or, oh, I have to do this kind of participatory stuff and I don't know what a hashtag is. So you try to avoid people having that kind of fear. Communication can be of assistance here. Perhaps. You can have a master of ceremonies, a presenter, or an event coach who helps people to find their way through this innovative technology. So all of this emotional psychology was supplemented subsequently by know-how from the world of neuronal research. Mr. Heusel, who's a real expert in studying the brain, found out something very interesting for us. It's conveyed in a way that marketing people can understand. There are various systems that determine what we do. There's the stimulant system, the dominant system, and the balance system. Stimulation is related to exploration, to discovery, interest and curiosity. The dominance system is linked to the idea of competition, of holding your own and pushing others out of the way. Now, interest plays a role there, but so does fury, the idea of sticking out your elbows to get your own way, being a little bit pushy. And what you also find is that the balance system strikes a balance between the two provides stability and security. Stimulants and dominance are both active. The balance, in a sense, is somewhat inhibitory. These are then supplemented by emotional modules, such as, for example, connection, care, sexuality, sleep, food, play, and hunting and the prey. Now, if you combine all of these different elements. That's the basis for our survival, and they're absolutely vital for our actions. And Mr. Heusel didn't discover only that, but he transposed it all into what is referred to as the limbic map. You can understand it as being a little like a map. There's the various different emotional systems, stimulants, dominance, and balance, and the motivations for our actions in these various groups. For example, we might want to have fun, engage in art, be creative, and that's part of the stimulants system. Power, being part of the elite. Performance tend to slot into the dominance system. 
safety, nostalgia, security, family, friends can be subsumed into the balance system. And you'll see that the, there's also overlap between the emotional systems, and sometimes the mixture is very important, and the balance and stimulation combination can give rise to fantasy, the imagination, and enjoyment. Balance gives it all something dreamlike. Stimulants activates, however, that stimulation triggers interest and curiosity, adventure and thrills is generally triggered by a combination of dominance and stimulation. It's the kind of feeling that makes us feel as if we had wings. We can really leap over our own shadow and break out of our boundaries. And if you look at a group where things are working well, they become a little overexcited possibly even giggly, and they're bold enough to do things they wouldn't be brave enough to do on their own. There's discipline and control, balance and dominance. Balance deals with order and stability. Dominance wants to determine the rules of the game. And that is a leitmotif that you find, for example, among sports people. They're shaped by the principle of discipline and control. And the way that our brain decides is based on the idea of this carrot and the stick. Things which are rewards and things which are punishments. So you might want to expect, you might expect a reward or a punishment. And that relates to the question of the Expectation. Then there's the, there's the pleasure or the pain that you might experience as well. Our brain is interested in attaining pleasure. We generally try to avoid punishment. And so the carrot and the stick is a system that you can actually adapt to the different systems that we see here emotionally. For example, the dominant system is satisfied by feelings such as proud, a sense of victory, self-esteem, and are lost, for example, in a sense of a lack of power, of fury. There's also the question of avoiding boredom. That is the punishment if the stimulant system is not stimulated. If we're bored in an event set up, then we also start to feel furious. We're furious because we're wasting our time. And then people leave and are in a bad mood, and they're mood has switched to something more negative. The balance system is determined by motifs such as stability, safety, security, feeling cozy, and insecurity, fear, anxiety, and stress are the negative aspects. Those are the ones that you're trying to avoid in that emotional system. Now, if we talk about emotions and emotional systems, we also have to wonder who is this applicable to? Can you apply this universally across the board? Is there something you have to bear in mind? Well, if we're talking about emotions and emotional systems, there are gender and age differences. That's partly for hormonal reasons. It's also because of changes in the structure of human personality in age. For example, when we're older, we tend to move away from systems of domination to systems of stimulation and balance, imagination and, and enjoyment. Perhaps some of you have realized that. Perhaps when you're, say, 15 or 16, 20, whatever, perhaps you used to go to every single party and didn't want to miss a thing. Maybe when you get to 30 or 40, you calm down a little. The reason is because you like to have things a bit more cozy and relaxed. That's partly related to the chemical cocktail that shapes our behavior, but it has something to do as well with experience. There's also the gender component in emotions. Now, I don't want to open up Pandora's box here and start discussing this, but just bear that in mind. Think about it, and you can make something out of it. People say that women focus more on the areas of stimulation and balance, whereas women, men tend to 
function within the dominance realm and the motivations related to that are ones that tend to appeal primarily to men. And that's the first step of our journey. Let me sum up briefly. Emotions and the emotional systems associated with them have a decisive impact on human beings' personality structures. Now, some of these are innate, and they're also partly shaped by socialization, education, experience, and culture. The big three are stimulation, dominance, and balance. Stimulation and dominance have an activating impact, whereas balance puts the brakes on. Stimulation triggers exploration, curiosity, interest. Domination also triggers interest and curiosity, but also fury and anger greater risk-taking propensity. The underlying motivation is a sense of power, competition, seeking to be the winner. Balance is related to security and stability, and it triggers caution, for example, by awakening fear or disgust. We have, as well, the principle of the stick and the card. The pleasure and the punishment principle. What does that all mean, though, if you're talking about event management? Why are we talking about this? There's a model, the ELM model, which Jan Drengna, a professor on event management, has also addressed. In fact, he used it in the course of his dissertation on event management. So if you take ELM and the Drängler image transfer model, don't worry, I'm not going to leave you on your own with this, but I'll take you carefully through this labyrinth. Right up at the top, you see a box with the event. Now, interest and curiosity comes into play here. What you want is that the participants will actually be able to put into practice what they want to do. They'll get the content they want. They'll get the messages that they're supposed to receive. And they tend to begin to come along to your event. And if they're really looking forward to being there and delighted to be there just for this two or three days, then they're very much involved in the message. It's a message-specific involvement. Now, if the participants can process the messages that are offered to them, which means that they have to be intellectually able to do that, and you as event manager also determine that through the way in which you stage the scene and use the dramaturgy to see whether they're overstretched or understretched, so to speak. But in the ideal scenario, primarily, positive notions emerge. Think of somebody presenting a car, for example. You come along, and the topic is the presentation of the new Mercedes SLK, and you experience exactly that car. You sit down and drive it around, and you learn Mercedes builds amazingly fast cars. Now, ideally, that will mean that you'll learn a message that stays with you. Your cognitive structures will change as a result, and you learn fantastic Mercedes fast car, buy it, and that's that. And you've got a series of changes which lead to a positive shift in attitude. If, however, before you get in the car, you've got the handle, your hands on the handle, you want to open the door, and suddenly the handle comes off, then you won't learn that Mercedes makes fantastic fast cars. You'll learn instead that it's poor quality. If you're brave, you'll get into the car all the same and go for a spin. But that negative experience will tend to be superimposed upon the positive experience, and you'll learn there's a change in the cognitive structures. You will learn, therefore, in that scenario that Mercedes builds bad cars. So you've got a whole series of changes that lead to a negative change in your attitude. Of all the attributes we've talked about, there are all these arrows going to the peripheral 
context variables which are present and what that means. If something is not satisfied, the peripheral context variables come into play. Imagine participants come along and they're just not at all interested. They've been stuck in a traffic jam and their boss sent them and their family's waiting for them. There's a birthday party. They have a relatively low involvement with the message related to specific action, but perhaps because of the kind of event, you encourage them to get involved. I mean, imagine you've got an event app that you're using for your event and your participants are using it. You might pose them a challenge. They have to solve particular tasks in groups, the ranking is put online, the results of the tests are put online, and then you have this participant who just could not be bothered, suddenly they're forced to do something. And possibly the person will be really furious about that because they don't just have to sit there comfortably and listen to what they're being told, but they actually have to make an effort. So it's really hard work for their brains, so they become furious, but they get into it slowly but surely, perhaps because the rest of the group is nice, perhaps you start to get interested in the task at hand, and then there are positive experiences, perhaps solving the task, maybe you come first or even second, and then pleasure and interest arises and transforms the region. Maybe a flow experience comes along. The flow experience is one that makes us forget space and time. Perhaps some of you experience that at home when you're cleaning. You know what it's like. You don't feel like it at all. And you get started, and all of a sudden, two to three hours have passed. And that flow experience helps to ensure that your participants go on an interesting trajectory. They were on a certain pathway, and they become involved in the message related to the specific actions. And there's another interesting aspect, too. You have to be careful to doze what you're presenting. A good mixture of old and new has to fit properly. You can only really er learn something new if you can dock that onto something older. So the challenge that you pose, the task to be done, might just stretch your participants a little bit so they'll be only slightly overstretched. That's then a good fit. And this all has to do with whether the whole event is a good fit, whether the topic of the event fits with you. If it was, for example, Richard Sport were suddenly involved in the World Swimming Championships, that would be a little bit strange because people think that sport and chocolate don't go hand in hand. There's a certain dissonance which emerges in our brains as a result of that. So at the end of the day, that means that through emotions, you can unleash a flow experience and steer participants back onto the smooth pathway. And in the ideal case scenario, if the door handle of Mercedes doesn't come off in your hand, which of course it doesn't, then you end up with positive attitudinal changes. So what can you actually do when it comes to adding digital elements? Because that's what this is all about. Do remember, interest and curiosity really steer people's perceptions. And if you have interest and curiosity on board, you'll be able to make your participants enthusiastic. Mila and partner, a Stuttgart creative think tank who comes up with interesting 3D solutions in space, and they have developed the following. Let me show it to you. It's called the No Thing. And the reason is that it's not linked to any particular device. You don't need a tablet. You don't need a smartphone. You don't need an iPad. You don't need a remote control or anything. You can do this anywhere at all. Now, how it works is the following. You take a bit of paper, and there are infrared dots stuck to it. You hand them out at the check-in, registration for the event, and so your participants might have their badge 
are a control element in their hands, and they determine what's happening as they head into the event. And sensors read the signals of the 3D markers, and there's a control software. It's a complex system, ultimately, underpinning this. So they read that, and they have projections running. They have films playing. To give you a better idea of how this all works, let me show you the following video. Die Türken der Technik. Geht der jetzt von alleine? Is this going to work on its own, or do I have to press the button? Es gibt auch Ton. There's also sound with it. In fact, I can also sing a song, but I don't think that uh, this will make people stay here. But they would rather leave. Kriegen wir Ton? Can we get some sound, please? So this is the technology and the uh, digital elements. They impress us and fascinate us and make us curious and uh, pique our interest if they are very easy to use. So if I take this uh, simple piece of paper and then move it forward and then I see projections and films after I've done it. So this is something that um, surprises us. And um, at the end of the day, it steers our attention. So our, the uh, stimulation system, so going back to the emotional systems, is the one that is activated by that. So this is what will make um, you successful. So when you address uh, the different senses, and that is the buzzword here is user experience. User experience is something that you need w to uh, generate positive experiences. So by that, I mean emotions and feelings that are triggered through this experience. User experience uses um, gaming elements so in order to satisfy our basic needs. What you need in order to uh, trigger some positive user experience is uh, an extended function that you can offer. So it is not only just this simple piece of paper, but rather that you can just like wave it around to the left, to the right, and just play with it. And so that means the curtain will be set in motion or whatever will happen then. So you need also good graphics, technical solutions will only impress us if uh, they look just like real life and if they are embedded in our reality. What else do you need? And this is something that no thing cannot do. You need uh, to give the possibility to give feedback because that 
creates uh, interaction, and this is exactly another buzzword because, in a way, we want to uh, have an interaction. We want to exchange ideas and experience, and the uh, type of uh, user experience, the quality of the user experience, will be enhanced when you uh, also increase the level of interaction that you can offer. So what else do you need to uh, take home with you? So to think in terms of the uh, carrot and stick approach. So offer rewards. This is very important. And of course, the simulation system is uh, then triggered by the no thing model. But uh, at the same time, it can make me feel bored. So you need to integrate that in an, in a very intelligent way into your event because why is that so so you need to think back to the uh, scheme that i showed you earlier so you need to try everything to avoid boredom so because when you're bored then you may become angry and then leave the room so if you bear all these elements in mind then you can create something that i would like to call real life experience this, this is the aspect that you will see so when you have the uh, the flow experience and forget uh, where you are and what time it is. So then you can use uh, gadgets and virtual virtual reality together with uh, the real life. So this is the what the picture expresses here. So this uh, was taken at the Mobile World, World Congress and Mark Zuckerberg used the. Uh, virtual reality goggles that he presented during this event. So virtual reality means that uh, you have some kind of a real life experience because very quickly by just putting on these glasses and maybe also putting on some gloves, you can enter virtual worlds immediately. So if we manage to get this real life experience triggered uh, by whatever, then it means that all the different types of uh, systems, emotional systems, can also be triggered. So with regard to uh, virtual reality, reality, my participants get into some kind of an imaginary world. So they are within the stimulation system. And then you, know, you can offer some kind of game. So when people interact with others, with other players, and which triggers the dominant system, the only system which I need to keep stable is the balance system. Because the fear of the unknown is always there. And uh, this is why you need communication. So the question that arises is, can we trigger emotions just by a pu push of a button? No, is my answer. So and the reason for that is that th this would require our technology to be that ex advanced. I mean, we'll get there eventually. So just uh, getting back to the buzzword of virtual reality so that uh, you uh, can activate uh, certain parts of the brain's hemisphere. But I mean, we can't do that right now. So but what about the digitization? Does it address all the sensory levels? And here my answer is yes, if I do it smartly. So <coughs> with this lim limbic map, this, uh, this plethora of emotional systems uh, needs to be taken into consideration. So just remember that 50% of our emotional portfolio is uh, what we are born with. And uh, the rest is uh, characterized by our culture, by our experiences, and by our personal life. So everybody perceives something different. And this is why I need to bear this limbic map in mind and offer all kinds of different uh, stimuli so that uh, I can reach out to all the participants. Because the participants, they will paint the world the way they like it. And this is why I will find something important, which is not at all important to you here in the audience. So, and uh, this takes me also to, all way, all, almost to the end of my presentation. So, and uh, to uh, to summarize it, I mean, you need to keep it simple. So, all the concepts need to be all the technical sort of concepts need to be used in the same as uh, sound and light. So, it is not that uh, you should uh, over ta tax people. So, just uh, to uh, to change from one image to another. So digital elements uh, will then create a wow effect and then direct the attention and then uh, trigger the stimulation system and uh, trigger interest and curiosity. But digital elements, I mean, let me just re repeat that all the time, so need to be integrated uh, intuitively in, into the event and it should be stable in, it, in their implementation because if some, something is not working, the wow effect uh, turns into a bar effect. So then we get disappointed and we may 
they get angry even so and uh, frustrated. So the wow effect, I mean, should not take attention away from the objectives of your, your event. So if it is too exciting, then you may remember for three years what happened. So there was some event somewhere and uh, we had this wonderful virtual reality gear that I could use and then I could enter into an imaginary world. But I can't remember what event it was and who the organizer was. So this was counterproductive. So as for organizers, we don't want that to happen. Digital elements can be used in ways when they are aligned with uh, the, your messages and when they uh, support you in achieving your objectives with your organization. So, and um, having said, said that, flowers say more than words. So this takes me to the end. Thank you very much for listening. So thank you, Doreen Bistup.